fine. Let's write it again. All right, take two. So we were talking about what are some of the traits that our organisms need to be successful in the water. And so we've largely up to this stage talked about respiration. So we looked at some of the challenges of breathing underwater. So why is water difficult to deal with? So we looked at things like viscosity and oxygen content. Um, and then we looked at uh, gill functionality, right? So we looked at things like countercurrent exchange. And then we ended on how exactly is it that we can get water actually moving across the gills. Remember the big feature here was, as we consider the fact that water is sort of difficult to get oxygen from, the big key behind things like countercurrent exchange and these uh, techniques is we really need to be as efficient as possible, right? So countercurrent exchange was how can we make sure <coughs> <coughs> We do this like anything escapes from our mouth, right? <clears throat> it's gonna be weird when the masks are gone and things actually like escape our face. It's gonna be very surreal for a little while, I think. I still hold that hope the mask will be gone someday. <clears throat> so as we think about countercurrent exchange, remember the key here was all along those secondary lamellae, we want to make sure we can be as efficient with gas exchange as possible. So every moment. That water and those the blood or the capillaries are touching, we can have gas exchange, right? And for both of these techniques, whether we're talking about water pumping, right, or ram ventilation, okay, how can we ensure that we're always getting fresh, constant water exchange? So it's a new oxygenated water to be using for that process. <clears throat> semester that there are some aquatic creatures that can breathe air okay which is neat in and of itself okay but it's a good strategy <clears throat> okay so this comes in two categories okay what we call facultative and obligate okay so this really refers to how much do these aquatic creatures rely on using air okay, to breathe. Okay, so for facultative, yellow is a terrible default. There we go. And that's like these guys here. Okay, that's a bircher and a mud skipper. Okay. Both of these guys kind of use air breathing as a backup. Okay, meaning, particularly if we think about something like birchers, that's this top guy, right? These guys live in the water 100% of the time. But I mean, they live in kind of crappy water. Okay, stagnant ponds, or ponds that don't move, ponds that get really low water levels. And so remember we said that water can get really low oxygen content. So organisms like these, right, are going to use air breathing when the water has such low oxygen, blah, 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 such low oxygen content right, that you really can't get anything out of it anymore. Right, so they're basically just breathing waste and carbon dioxide through their gills, right? So we're not getting much through there anymore. So instead, they can poke their little face out and go bear and get some real oxygen through that. Okay, until the rains come or whatever business, right, fixes their situation. Okay. Other ways this can be used, if we focus on our cute little mud skippers here, okay, we can even see in this photo, we've got some of these nice little, let's get my circle all the way here, reinforced fins up front. Yeah, buddy. 
Okay, so as their name implies, there's several species of fish that can kind of like scooch across the mudflats. They can get out of the water for a short period of time, not very long. But they use this to hunt, okay? Also, okay, they have some bright blue stuff in their mouth, which they flare to attract the lady, lure them back to their dens, which are underwater, right? So while they're outside of the water doing their thing, okay, for very short spurts of time, they can breathe air. Okay, so they go back underground, underwater, okay, where they spend most of their time and use their gills. Okay, so the key here these talk to is right for short periods of time or for very specific activities, we can breathe air. But the vast majority of the time, right, we're using our gills. We're breathing underwater. For obligates, okay, and so this is much less common. Okay, only a handful of fishes do this. Okay, air is the primary way that these fishes will survive. This is how they're respiring. So this is the example I have here. Okay, the best example of this is literally called the lungfish. It's a whole species. Okay, they're very cool if you ever get the opportunity to see them. Right, means When you keep them, for example, function a lot like having an amphibian or a reptile, right? Their tanks have to have air in them, right? You have to have space when they climb up on a rock hang out and breathe, right? Or they will literally dry drown. <clears throat> okay, so if we look here, world's worst arrow, okay? Instead of having things like we expect and we've seen, right, in the last two weeks in our fishes, things like swim bladders, and gills, right, we have sort of we expect to see inside like mammals and amphibians, right, lungs, okay? In other words, air sacs that allow them to more efficiently exchange actual air, right, and then hold their breath when they go underwater. All right, so this is more uncommon, but they do exist. Living their best fishy lives. Okay. Any questions about respiration? <clears throat> All right. So the next thing we want to talk about is buoyancy. Remember, when we're talking about buoyancy, we mean the ability to adjust our height or depth right within the water column. Okay, and so we've seen a couple of these techniques already in lab, which is kind of nice. So remember, where we are in the water column or how deep we are matters, right? And one of the big, <coughs> um, things we've really been focusing on, particularly with our upgrades, is control, right? How can I control where I am? So, some of the techniques we've already seen, so we think about our cartilaginous fishes, right, our chondrichthys, okay, these big heavy fishes. <clears throat> One of the first things we saw was that big fatty liver or that oily liver, okay. <clears throat> this is like the biggest thing in their body, right, is that three-part, three-lobe liver. It was very long. And comparatively, even to the livers that we've already seen and certainly to all of the other organs that we've seen, it was pretty juicy. It was very oily. Okay, so much so it was pretty easy to damage too. If you handled it a little bit, it kind of just tore and crumbled in our fingers because of the, the oil and the lipid content in it. <clears throat> okay. The other thing that our sharks had what was called a heterocircle tail. Okay, so hetero, remember this prefix here, just means different. So it just means differently lobed. 
caudal fin or differently lobed tail fin. Okay, so if we look at the one that I have circled here, right, what that literally means is this top lobe is big, right, and this bottom lobe is little. All right, little is not going to fit. Let's try small. Plan ahead. Okay. If we compare that to, say, C, okay, C is what we're kind of used to seeing, right? This is what our fish is this week had. Right, remember, we measured to our fork length this week, which was all the way to the end of here. Okay, so this is a homo circle tail. Okay, so homo literally meaning same. So this would be same lobed, right? Because our top and bottom lobe here is the same. So if we look at the function of a caudal fin, right? This is the tail, okay? If we think about flipping a tail, we know that one of the key features here, just like putting a propeller on the back of a boat, is thrust. All right, if I flip, choo, 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 choo. I'm running out of space. We're going to erase a little bit here. Okay. If I flip this back and forth, right, I know that I'm going to get thrust. And okay. we know that's kind of the point of having a tail back there, right? We know that was the key behind a post anal tail, right, is that we get good control and good motion forward. Okay, check, 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 check. So what's the big deal behind this heterocircle tail? So as we look at, let's just kind of clean this up a little here. Having that top lobe being quite large, relatively speaking, when I switch that tail, whoop, that tail, helps if I point the right place, Okay, I'm still going to get that thrust, right? I'm still swooshing, okay? But in addition to swooshing left and right, which is going to propel me forward, right, I'm swooshing more up at the top, right? So I'm getting kind of a downward push with it as well. Okay, so that's going to push me forward, okay? and also push me up a little, okay, which helps keep me up in the water column. Okay, so for our big chonky cartilaginous sharks, this is plenty, okay, and it helps, right, remember it being cartilaginous, right, their internal structure isn't as heavy, right, cartilage isn't as heavy as bone is. <clears throat> so this is enough to keep these guys going. These two features clear. We see how these work in cahoots together to keep our cartilaginous fishes afloat. Whew. Now, if we remember from this week, right, <clears throat> our perch, you guys had Mexican gray perch um, to cut on. <clears throat> did not have heterocircle tails, right? We had the homocircle tails. So we had to use a different set of techniques in order to give us buoyancy. <coughs> so instead, you guys exposed what was called the swim bladder or the air bladder, right, depending on which text you were looking at. <coughs> Gracious. All right, so the swim bladder is basically a balloon, right, inside the fish, okay? So we got to see that this week. In most cases, your swim bladders were still intact, and therefore, at least to some degree, literally still inflated. Okay, so you got to see kind of to some degree, I think I've said that like three times now, um, how these things still function, okay? So if we look at our fishes here, right, we can kind of imagine a literal balloon, okay? So the more 
my balloon or my bladder is inflated with air, right? Just like the more you pump a balloon filled with air, right, the lighter it becomes. So the more it can float in the water. If I deflate my balloon a little bit, right, it'll have less air in it, which would allow me to sink a little bit. All right. So the swim bladder is a really neat system because this gives me really finite second to second control. Ooh. of my depth in the water column. Okay, so as we look here, there's basically two ways to fill your swim bladder, right? In other words, how do I put air in it? Okay, so the first one is the most, man, is the most simple. Okay, if I think about where my air bladder is, okay, the first way I can do this is called Phaistostomus. Okay, in other words, I didn't name these things, so you just have to deal with working with me. <clears throat> Never shoot the messenger, right? Is we are going to connect it straight to the digestive tract, right? And that's pretty close to that. So we're just going to have a separate tube that goes up from the digestive tract to our swim bladder. Okay. So when the fish is swimming around, it can swallow, right, we can pop our little face up, we can swallow a little bit of air. Now we're not breathing the air, right? But we can swallow air, right? So we're not sending the air to the gills. This is not a lung. Okay, so it's literally like when you swallow air, Right? But in this case, right, that air is going to get shunted from the stomach up to that air bladder. <gasps> so I can fill that air bladder up very simply that way. Right? And if I want to empty my air bladder out, right, I'm connected to the digestive tract, right? So I can make little fishy farts, right? Little bubbles go up and I can sink down in the water column that way. Okay. So this is nice and simple, but it of course has one problem. If I'm gonna swallow air in order to fill my swim bladder, that means I have to have easy and regular access to that air. Okay. So this is only gonna work for fishes that are like in shallow water, okay, like in a pond or a river, where I can easily get up to that water. If I'm a deep water fish, I live in the ocean, right? I don't regularly swim up to the top. That's not a reasonable way to do this. <clears throat> so the other way we can do this then is by what's called the physoclestus way. Again, I didn't name it, man. <clears throat> hey, but instead what ends up happening is there's special glands Okay, like a thyroid type system in the fish's body, okay, that helps pull loose gas. Okay, it does not have to be oxygen, right? This can be oxygen or carbon dioxide. It's just bubbles of gas. Okay, that is already in the bloodstream. Okay, that's occurring from the regular gas exchange. So as the fish is already going about doing its regular respiration, right? There is already oxygen and carbon dioxide in the blood. And so these glands are just pulling a little bit of surplus of these gases from the blood, okay? And it's following a special pathway, kind of like the lymph system, okay? And taking them um, to or from the swim bladder that way. <clears throat> So it's very similar. This is just a little more circuitous, right? I can't directly gulp that air. So now I have a special gland that's going to sneak steal, right, some of that gas directly from my bloodstream. <clears throat> okay, so we might imagine, right, something like <coughs> a black crappie, for example. 
right, or something that you might fish from a pond, maybe a trout would do that top one. Okay, but maybe something like a tuna, a herring, sardines, right, things that live and migrate in the ocean and are not generally swimming along the top would have our fiso cleats fit. Okay. The functionality and the difference in needs of these two are very clear. Okay, so let's talk about sensory mechanisms then. All right, so we've gotten to see these a little bit over these last two weeks too, and you guys have dealt with several of these different types of sensory mechanisms on our fishes. All right, and again, one of the big keys that we're focusing on on why these exist is as we go underwater, the normal things we think about for sensory, right, hearing, vision, this stuff sucks underwater, okay, at least the way we do it, okay, if you put your head underwater, your vision sucks, right, your ability to hear is extremely dampened, okay, so if we are going to live successfully underwater, we're going to need a variety of either alterations or new techniques that are going to make it so we can hunt successfully, Right, so I can find someone when I want to find them. And if I don't want to find someone, I need to have that ability too. Right? I need to live. So how can we navigate that system more successfully? All right. So this is the key. Right? Just like our senses really only work very well in air, okay? fish's senses are only going to work really well in water. Okay. So their big key, and one of the big keys we're going to see, is the detection of water movement itself. Okay. So why is this particular feature so important? Right. So most of what we see with water movement is this is kind of a proxy if the water is moving a lot this means someone is moving it right so we can interpret they they right the royal we can interpret that and try to understand well this water movement must be an organism of this size that's friend or not friend okay so this is one of the major techniques it is and they can use that then to decide i'm going to eat or i'm going to run and not be eaten So we call that, in particular, mechanoreception, right, the mechanical or movement. So we got to see this a little bit, right, this week. Okay, one of the main features that nearly all fishes have is the lateral line. All right, so we pulled some scales from this this week, and you'll get to look a little more at that next week as well. All right, so the lateral line runs all along the fish. It was most obvious as we looked at sort of the racing stripe. <coughs> <coughs> along the sides of its body. Okay. There are additional hits with the same kind of mechanoreceptors along its face, which are a lot harder to see because the face is made of that tough bone. Okay, so what makes the lateral line is that it's actually a series, out my way, it's actually a series of pits or holes in the fish. And inside these pits or holes are a type of nerve. Okay, so these are big nerves, right? That's the key because they're in these big pits or pores. <clears throat> and these nerves are specifically designed to di de detect, ooh, detect water vibrations. Okay, and they're very, very good at it. Sort of like we just imbued, 
It's not just simple movement, but it's good at detecting both size and frequency. So if I'm standing here and you guys are moving around, right, I can tell if it's just Jenna moving her pencil, right, or if somebody gets up to go to the bathroom or if someone quite large comes through the door, right, I can sense all of that just from my lateral line, right? <clears throat> and there's some big differences in movement, right? Just from the small pencil movement to whole body movements. Okay, and these are key, theoretically, to my survival, right? Understanding minor things, right? Those pencil movements that have nothing to do with me, theoretically. Someone just living their life in a space near me, right? Feeding, swimming around, doing whatever it is they do, okay? Versus someone coming through the door, okay, which depending on their speed and size, okay, is something that would need my attention. Okay. In addition, okay, these can also help us see other obstacles. Okay, so in water that's quite dark or gloomy or cloudy or turbid, this can help fish navigate spaces, right? So things like kelp and seagrasses are also going to be moving, okay? <clears throat> so this can help fish navigate very heavily obstacle areas without smashing their face in this stuff constantly, which is also good for overall fish health. Okay, so lateral line feel good? All right, so this is a really key feature for fish movement, right? And so largely, even if a fish can't see, if it were completely blind, it still has a very good idea of its space around it. The other thing we looked at this week was the inner ear. All right. Now, we started to see this a little bit. All right, this is what we saw this week. Oh, rude, rude, rude. Sorry about that, everyone. Okay, where we were able to pull the otolith out this week. Okay. Now, in general, inner ears work more or less the same as ours do. Right? So... The goal here is still some kind of balance and equilibrium. And the core version of this is some kind of fluid. Okay, so our ears, for example, we have just this top bit. Okay, the three semicircular canals that move in multiple directions. So the idea is if you close your eyes, you have semicircular canals running in multiple directions and there's fluid in them. So when I tip forward, sideways, okay, that fluid shifts around, okay, and gives my body a sense of how am I oriented in three-dimensional space, okay, based on how that fluid is sitting, okay, this is why when you get, like, ear infections, okay, there's extra fluid in those spaces, so you feel unbalanced because you can't interpret how that fluid is sitting in your ears, Neat, huh? So, okay, for right, our early fishes and our cartilaginous fishes, please excuse my abbreviations, that's all they have. And it works pretty good, but you might imagine there's some minor limitations to interpreting how fluid is floating in a body that's floating in fluid. And it still works. My butt. So the reason we have the otoliths, right, these are our osteichthys. Again, please, uh, almost looks like ostrich. Please uh, excuse my abbreviations. When we get into our osteichthys, we have the addition, this is a unique trait, 
of those bony otoliths, which is what you pulled out this week. Right, now, in addition to aging the fish, which we'll talk about in lab, <clears throat> what we've done is now add some weight, right, a bony stone, into a fluid-filled space. Okay, now, this will help to some degree with detecting vibrations. Right now, you have a bony space that will help with our vibrations, just like the lateral line did. Okay? And this will also help, because now you have a stone sitting in fluid. Right? So just like ice sitting in fluid, that's going to sink as you turn and move. So it becomes much easier to interpret how fluid is sitting in a cavity when you also have something heavy sitting in that fluid because that fluid is also sitting in fluid. So this becomes a much more efficient and effective system to understand balance and understand vibrations. So bony fishes are very, very, very good. Super lucky I have that up here. Okay, do the semicircular canals and the otolith both make sense in their usefulness? Okay, so we're starting to get a good idea of how fishes are starting to understand and navigate their space. Now everything we've talked about so far our fishes aren't actually seeing anything, right? So they're moving around pretty much blind up to this stage. Okay? I'm interpreting both my surroundings and my orientation of my surroundings without any visual input so far. Now, let's start that in class next time. I think that'll be a good way to start. All right, so let's look at some other ways that we can navigate. So we've seen this too. My electroreception. So everything that we looked at before was some kind of mechano or vibration and touch based thing. Okay, electroreception. K is going to be based on, as the name implied, electrical impulses. <clears throat> okay, so we only saw this in our chondrichthys. This is largely a chondrichthys trait, although there are some of our bony fishes that have this too. It's just not all bony fishes have this, right? It's only some. It's a specialized trait. So the key here, as we see, right, on our sharks, this was called the ampullae of Lorenzini. Right, and so this is a really extensive set of very similar type pits, right, or pores. <clears throat> so like the lateral line, we basically have a set of pores that have nerves in them. Okay, but these nerves, instead of detecting movement and vibrations, detect very small electrical impulses. <clears throat> and now when we're talking about electrical impulses, right, note that we mean very small ones. Right, life electrical impulses. Okay. So remember, every time that you do something, you're creating very small amounts of electricity, right? When your heart beats, when you flex your muscles, okay, all of these things create electricity, okay? And that's what this is picking up. And this becomes very cool and also creepy. And okay, when you think about when you get scared, Right, your heart beats faster, so it puts out more electricity. Okay, when you try to run away, okay, you put out more electricity because you're flexing more muscles. Okay, so 
Every time these guys are chasing or actively hunting, right, and fish become afraid or they try to escape, they're putting out more electricity, making them, by proxy, easier to hunt. This is a very horror movie, but very cool. Right? So this is a really effective hunting strategy. In addition, there are versions of these that will produce a little bit of electricity themselves. Okay, now we're not gonna start electricity and so the whole pond is like shocking or anything. Okay, but it's a very small targeted amount. Okay. So there are um, electric rays. We've probably all heard of electric eels, which is a type of fish as well. So these are all born of these same sort of pits. Okay. And so ultimately what happens is the fish is using its own body electricity and it kind of stores it up and then releases it in a very small, tiny pulse. This does not kill anything, usually, unless it's very, very small. But usually it either surprises or stuns it, as you might imagine. Okay? Sort of like when you get electrocuted, most of the time, right? most of us are not electricians, so we're not going to die from what we've done unless we've done something extraordinarily stupid. But most of us have been electrocuted in our life, right? been zapped by an outlet or a blender that's maybe lived its life a little too long, right? These things have not killed us, but we've certainly been shocked, right? Maybe we've been hurt, okay? That moment that you've had with that, okay, that's that same moment that they want, okay? That pause that that fish is like, what happened? Okay, where am I, okay? My fins won't move for exactly five seconds, and now I'm dead. Right? That second of I don't know what to do or I can't escape is all that shark needs or the eel needs or the whatever. Oh, right. <clears throat> so these are the details on the uh, ampullae of Lorenzini, right? So here, as I mentioned before, this is largely what we're using these for. The ampullary, like ampullae of Lorenzini. So this is the type of this is largely, so we mentioned that we can use them to shock. Largely, we're using them to detect. Are these shark shocking? Most sharks can't, but rays can. All right, so remember, they're in the same family. Okay, and remember I said some fishes can also do this. So this is a sturgeon, or a, I'm sorry, a paddlefish. My brain just shut down. So this is a paddlefish named because of its large paddle. Okay. The whole underside of that paddle also has these ampullae underneath it. You guys will get to see this fish in class as well. Not that's big, but we have a baby one that we get to play with. Okay, so as I mentioned, right, all our sharks, skates, and rays, right, all our chondrichthys have this. But like we see here, right, some of our regular fishes have this too. Right, and that's not surprising because it is such an effective hunting, hunting strategy. Any questions about electroreception? Okay, so let's start talking about vision. We probably won't get all the way through this, but that's okay. We'll start here on Friday, right? So 
fish do have eyes. Okay, so even though we haven't talked about vision yet, um, they do have it. But certainly, right, because you know your eyes think underwater. We know that their eyes have to function differently than ours if they're going to be effective in any way, shape, or form. So we know that water has to affect vision. It does this in a variety of ways. Okay? The first of which, if we just focus on this first bullet point, has to do with what's called light refraction. Okay? Meaning refraction has to do with focusing. So the way that water is focused, or I'm sorry, light is focused, is affected by water. Okay? And so specifically, so this is us on the right. Right, or something that's on air. Okay, Our cornea, which is sort of that front kind of clear piece over the front of your eye, does the vast majority of our light refraction. Okay, in other words, this is what focuses most of the images that your eye sees. Okay, this is why we can get LASIK, right, which is that laser surgery that cor corrects your vision so you don't have to wear glasses anymore. We can get LASIK because our cornea does most of the vision work. So we can reshape that and make it do a better job. Okay. Cornea does work. And then this lens bit here does the little bit of leftover work. Right. So cornea does the bulk. And that lens does sort of like the last 5%. Maybe 10 The problem with water and why your vision sucks under water is because water focuses and bends light the exact same way as your cornea does. So when you go under water, the light is already bent and changed in the same way that your cornea would fix it. And so your eye doesn't know or have any way to do anything with it once it's already under there. So, if I'm a fish, fish, I'm not going to use my cornea then to do anything. That's a waste of time. So, if we look at our fish image, we see here that our cornea is super flat. Right? There's no point in making it rounded. It's not going to do anything. So instead, we're going to use the other tool in our eye. Okay, so here we can see the lens is super duper huge and rounded. Right? Because for them, they need to use the second step to do most of the light refraction. Okay, something that's going to act differently than the water medium they're already in. Hmm. Okay, we will stop there. We will pick up right on this slide on Friday. We'll re-review the cornea and lens thing, of course, and then finish up about, pardon me, all the rest of vision and water business. Why are you being this way today? All right, when you're all done, my back two rows, you're free.
free to leave. Please have a wonderful day and um, drive safe if it actually does get around to doing the whole snow thing. I don't even know what to expect anymore with this kind of stuff. Know, it looks like it's just a three flight exit from now to Friday morning. I Thank you, Noah. Know. That's exactly what I thought. That's, good time like that. that's, that's what I thought too. I'm like, I'm used to getting that in like two hours where I come from, so I don't know whether this is going to be dramatic. But then it said like three inches of ice, and I'm like, does that mean over three days? Does that mean in an hour? Because then we're all going to die. Like I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, that's a huge deal, yes. Yeah, Everyone else, you're welcome to leave. Yes, I agree, exactly. Beckley also always gets hammered. I don't know what it is about that city. It is cursed. <laughs> Have a good day, guys. <laughs> yeah. Yes, ma'am. So, I'm just living how I live here. So, if we do get like the rain and snow, my mom doesn't want me driving. Girl, if we do get a lot of rain and snow, I'm still hanging out for a snow day, so. <laughs> <laughs>